is introduce Dr. Bettina Payton and let her tell her story about being an MD who was an atheist and a materialist and had a near-death experience during the birth of her third child. Bettina. Thank you, Marjorie. First, I'll share some highlights from my near-death experience, and then I'll describe its impact on my life. And the main point I want to convey in telling my story is the close link between a near-death experience and meditation. In my case, my brush with death triggered a deep meditative state. My story begins in childhood, when my father told me that nothing happens after we die. I became an atheist on the spot, and my subsequent medical education reinforced the certainty that what you see is what you get. I was confident that when your body dies, it's all over. As a physician, I was taught that death is the enemy, to be fought at all costs. As a member of the hospital resuscitation team, I'd rush to the rescue, pumping on a patient's chest, barking out orders, trying to save a life, with, which back in the 1980s was almost always an exercise in futility. Virtually none of the patients left the hospital alive. I used to feel bad putting the patients through what we called a flog. I'd look down at the body and wonder if the person was at all conscious, and what it would be like, how miserable and scary, to be conscious while being subjected to a futile death ritual, only to slip away into oblivion. Amazingly, two years later, this is exactly what happened to me. I was totally aware as I went through the dying process. But instead of being scared, I was in a blissful, transcendent state. During my second pregnancy, an ultrasound showed that the placenta had grown over the birth canal and also was covering the entire front inner wall of my uterus. This meant that my surgeon, while performing a cesarean section, would have to cut directly through the placenta, which is essentially a spongy mass of dilated veins. So to prepare for what we knew would be significant blood loss, I began donating my own blood to be transfused back if needed. We also knew that as my uterus enlarged, the placenta would be stretched and might start to bleed. Sure enough, in the seventh month, the bleeding began and I was admitted to the very hospital where I'd completed my training two years before. The bleeding continued a little every day. The plan was to deliver the baby as soon as its lungs were mature enough to breathe on its own. My husband, also a doctor in the same hospital, came to my bedside every evening with our year-old twin boys for a bedtime story and a kiss goodnight. Finally, one month later, the baby's lungs are ready, and now I'm lying on the operating room table, being prepared for surgery. Several bags of my own blood hang ready on the IV pole above my right shoulder. While the nurse scrubs my abdomen and lays down the surgical drapes, I'm trying to act nonchalant, joking with my anesthesiologist as he inserts a large bore IV in each arm. The cool flow of the anesthetic enters my vein and I lose consciousness. I am unconscious for some time until suddenly I hear the anesthesiologist's voice. Her blood pressure is too low. I'm amazed to be awake, but not just awake, super alert, more aware than I've ever been in my life. How wondrous that this super alert state is beyond the reach of the drugs bathing my brain. I can feel the painless tugging of the surgery. I can't see because my eyelids are taped shut to protect the corneas but I can hear the anesthesiologist anxiously asking the surgeon about blood loss. The surgeon's tense answer is shocking. The baby's gone. Just as my mind tries to grapple with those words, the anesthesiologist cries out, shit, now she has no blood pressure at all. In the next instant, 
I feel a profound stillness in the center of my chest. Something's missing. It's the beat of my heart. My heart has stopped beating and nobody else knows it yet. Then suddenly, I can see everything in the room. There are the bags of blood hanging on the IV pole, already being transfused. My anesthesiologist crouched on his stool next to me, oblivious to the fact that I have no heartbeat. Then a series of loud beeps from the cardiac monitor sends out the alarm. The anesthesiologist springs up and slams the large red knob on the wall, summoning the hospital resuscitation team. He flings off the surgical drapes and begins pumping on my chest with his muscular arms. My ghostly pale body flops up and down. The worst has happened. I've lost my baby, I've lost all my blood, and now I'm having a cardiac arrest. But amazingly, instead of being terrified, I'm watching the catastrophe from a space of extraordinary equanimity even as I realize I'm dying. It's all over, and I'm about to slip into nothingness. But first, a flog. In a moment, the resuscitation team will burst into the room, pounce on my body, and go through the motions of the usual ritual. But something in me already knows. It's useless to fight. The only thing to do is relax and let go. The stillness in my chest expands, and I can feel a current of energy drawing me inside. I let go into the flow, floating deep inside. All awareness of the room and of my body drops away. I'm floating toward an edge, toward a fast emptiness beyond. And then, gliding over an invisible threshold, I plunge backward in a graceful freefall, down and down into nothingness. Darkness engulfs me, and then nothing. No sense of the world or of my own existence. Total blankness. Kaboom! A thundering sound echoing all around, and I'm suspended in space, as if I've exploded through some great barrier. I am free. The echoes fade away. Profound silence. Velvety darkness, like the night sky, all around. An endless expanse of radiant darkness, shimmering, mesmerizing. In all directions, without horizon, astounding beauty, boundless, sparkling light. Everywhere I turn, this light is, is looking back at me. It knows me. This light is conscious. This beautiful light is consciousness itself. All-knowing, all-powerful, humming with possibility. And the recognition dawns. This is the supreme reality. I am filled with awe and exhilaration. I begin to soar through the vast expanse, delighting in its astonishing splendor in every direction. Then I become still, envel enveloped in velvety peace, resting in perfect repose. You must live. I hear a voice. A command, not in words, but in a kind of thunder. You must live. I hear it again. The command is simple, but baffling. Then I see a twinkling point of light, nestled deep within the darkness. A shimmering, multifaceted sphere, and on its many facets, colors flickering. Scenes of a life. I once lived, all playing out simultaneously. My life, my entire world, contained in a grain of flickering light. You must live. 
The command resounds a third time, and now it is clear. I am to return to that life. But how can I possibly fit into that tiny world? And besides, that person's life is all over. How can it possibly be resurrected? Then, in an unbroken flow of wordless communication, the knowledge of how I am to return to that life streams into my awareness. I must be fearless. I must remain focused in the present moment. I must maintain the certainty that I am going to live. Any distraction or worrying, and I might not revive. There's a sudden stirring and a roaring sound like rushing wind, and I swirl around in a descending spiral, zooming downward at great speed, and then, just as suddenly, the commotion halts, and my vision opens into the operating room. I am watching from above, the scene spread out below, unfolding as if not a moment has passed. There's blood on the floor, the anesthesiologist is still pumping on my chest, and the surgeon is toiling away in my blood-filled abdomen. The resuscitation team is rushing in, doctors, some young ones whom I'd helped train, bursting through the double doors and practically skidding to a stop, wide-eyed and breath breathless. As they take their places around my body, I can feel their minds bracing for the inevitable. She's already gone. And it's true, my limp body, drained of all its blood, looks beyond any hope of resuscitation. Maintaining contact with the expanded state, I'm like an opening through which the power of consciousness pours into the room. The life of Bettina in the foreground, the great space of consciousness in the background, both filled with the same beautiful light. The atmosphere is charged with energy, guiding the efforts of the team. Yes, yes, you can do it. I'm going to live. Now let's get to work. The room is churning with personnel, the whole team in sync, moving together as if in a choreographed dance. My certainty that I will live pours forth in nonstop encouragement. Yes, yes, you're doing great. I'm going to live. And as far as resuscitations go, this one is going amazingly well. But despite all their best efforts, they can't restart my motionless heart. And then I see a man, his white hair like a halo around his head, dressed in blue scrubs, a senior surgeon, entering the operating room. Without a word, he reaches into my abdomen. As his hand disappears into the lake of blood, my point of view drops down, and I'm watching from inside my body. I can see his hand searching around, finding the largest artery, my aorta. Wrapping his fingers around it, he clamps the great vessel shut. There's an intense stab of pain deep in my core, and then an explosion of white-hot light, like a sunburst, spreading at lightning speed throughout my body, branching into millions of delicate channels, lighting up every pore, every cell. The touch of this light is searingly hot. Its brilliance, stunning. Its intimacy, both terrifying and blissful. I lie there in fear and awe and gratitude because now I know I am going to live. I'm no longer watching the scene from above. I'm now stationed in my body. Lying flat on the operating table, all I feel is love. And all I can see is light radiating from my body. Then I hear the voice of the elder surgeon. Stop compressions. He can feel a throbbing in my aorta. Everyone falls silent, waiting. Sure enough, eight minutes after it stopped, my heart is beating again. 
I am ecstatic, brimming over with energy and such joy and gratitude that I want to leap up and dance around the room. A few minutes later, one of the doctors leans over and whispers in my ear a message that fills me with even more joy. You have a beautiful baby girl, and she's doing fine. Just five days later, I left the hospital alive, revived and mystified, with a beautiful baby girl in tow. I was me again, but I was not the same. I felt totally new, and for a time, my awareness and perception were extraordinarily sensitive and open. I could sense the inner state of others and felt connected to people, even from a distance. I could look inside my body and see my own organs. I could feel an intense but harmless heat deep inside, like my whole spinal cord was glowing red hot. And nothing, not even bags of ice laid out on my body, could cool it. And when someone touched me, I could feel energy flowing between us. I had entered the hospital as a close-minded skeptic with a view of reality that was often cynical. I came out wonderstruck, awakened to the sacred foundation of all existence and ecstatic, overflowing with a sublime love I never knew existed. I couldn't wait to tell my husband the good news. You're not your body. Dying is nothing to be afraid of. My husband, <clears throat> an atheist, looked at me like I was crazy. When I tried to tell him what I had discovered, I only had one word, consciousness. To him, this word was merely a medical term we used to diagnose the level of alertness in a patient. No, no, you don't understand, I said. The consciousness I'm talking about is something extraordinary. This consciousness is all pervasive, all-knowing, all-powerful. He shook his head. These words reminded him of the religion he had rejected long ago. No, you are the one who does not understand, he said. Nothing extraordinary happened. It's just a fantasy, an altered state produced by your oxygen-deprived brain. But I knew what I had experienced. And I also knew that it was possible to return to this experience without having to nearly die. So I set off in search of understanding. I found the first books on near-death experiences, which led me to attend a meeting of the local IONS group in Boston. It was just a handful of people back in 1988, sharing our experiences, and no one seemed to know how to get back to that transcendent state. Then I found an important clue. I was reading a brochure for a conference on mind-body medicine, and the word meditation literally jumped off the page. It was almost as if the consciousness of my near-death experience was in that word. My next thought was, I need a teacher. I went to a program on meditation, and they showed a video of one of the meditation teachers, a woman, as she spoke, I didn't hear a word she said. I just stared at her eyes. In them, I saw something. She knows. She knows whatever it is I need to know. I decided to do whatever it took to meet her face to face. With great difficulty, I arranged for coverage at my job, managed to convince my husband to take care of our three little ones for the weekend, and set off for a meditation workshop. When I arrived, I was told I could see the teacher at the morning chant. The next morning, when the teacher walked into the meditation hall, my heart jumped the moment I laid eyes on her. Something in the way she moved, the graceful swing of her gait, her flowing robes told me that this was no ordinary person. I recognized the power of that extraordinary consciousness in her, emanating from her. It filled the room. My heart began to pound as she took her seat and joined in the chant. 
and something inside was lengthening my spine, making me sit bolt upright so that my head towered above the crowd. An energy rose up and poured out through my eyes, beaming on the teacher like a spotlight. And then I heard a voice inside, a deep part of my own being say, look at me. And then again, louder, look at me. And a third time, like a silent roar, look at me. At that very instant, the teacher raised her eyes from her chanting book. Slowly, her head began to turn in my direction. The sweep of her gaze halted, and I knew the exact moment that her eyes found mine. Suddenly, a ray of sparkling light was bridging the distance between us, and it seemed as if I traveled along it at great speed, falling right into her eyes, falling into the identical state of expanded consciousness that I'd experienced when I almost died. The same radiant darkness, the same expanse of beautiful sparkling light all around, the same freedom, the same ecstasy. But this time, I could feel the teacher's presence. In that state, we were one. Then I heard her speak inside my mind. Welcome home. You have come home. Her words unleashed a river of love, cascading down like a mighty waterfall, so powerful that I lost all awareness. When I regained consciousness, tears of joy had already soaked the front of my shirt. My whole body seemed to be melting in waves of love, and for the rest of the workshop, I kept gliding spontaneously in and out of deep meditation. That blissful state ebbed over several days, but now I knew meditation was my way back home. My near-death experience brought many changes to my life. For one thing, it launched me on the path of meditation. It also gave me the courage to take an extended leave from medical practice to go home and raise my children. The near-death experience inspired me to change the direction of my career as a physician. I decided to devote my medical practice exclusively to end-of-life care. I joined the first wave of physicians in creating the new specialty of hospice and palliative medicine and helped to establish and directed one of the first state-of-the-art inpatient hospice facilities in New England. My near-death experience was perfect training for caring for patients at the end of life. It gave me the ability to discern between physical, psychological, and spiritual suffering, and to address each of them with the appropriate modality. It gave me the ability to sense where a patient is in the dying process, to connect on a nonverbal, energetic level, and offer companionship and encouragement. Having experienced the energy that passes between people through touch, I now had a new respect for touch as a powerful way to convey comfort. But the most potent, potent medicine I had to offer was my inner state. It was my lack of fear and the stillness cultivated by meditation that brought the most comfort. My daughter is now 30 years old. And even now, not a day goes by without me remembering my near-death experience. I've made some progress in assimilating its gifts. Those who have known me over the years tell me I've gotten much more fun to be around. <laughs> they say I'm more relaxed and natural, and that I'm good in a glitch or an emergency. My husband and I recently hosted 150 guests at our home for our son's wedding. Instead of getting all uptight as I would have years ago, I stayed relaxed. I enjoyed the whole occasion immensely, and when people remarked on how calm I was, I would smile, knowing it's all because of my near-death experience. So thank you for letting me share my story. Near-death experiences are a powerful revelation that can change your worldview. But for most of us, it takes time, perhaps a lifetime to assimilate its gifts. 
Meditation has helped me understand and reaccess and begin to express the great love that was awakened in my near-death experience. If you've had a near-death experience, you've had an experience of meditation. Meditation is a tried and true way to assimilate and unfold what you've been given. So if you're at all curious, check it out. Find out for yourself. Thank you.